I don't need an alarm to wake up in the morning. The million thoughts in my mind do the trick. Set the plan for the day and ready to set the sails to new heights. Then I'm stranded because the winds get rather weak. Round and round I go. What am I waiting for? Sometimes I get trapped in my head, get trapped in my head, get trapped in my head. Why can't I be breathing instead, breathing instead? Whoa, whoa, oh, someone get me out of my head, get me out of my head, get me out of my head. But it keeps coming back to be that someone can only be me, me. That someone can only be me. I fall, tripping over my excuses, like dirty laundry they keep piling up more and more, then the pity party kicks in, and I dance away till the music stops, in a loop I'm right back where I was before, this isn't who I am, oh shit, here I go again, come on, Sometimes I get trapped in my head, get trapped in my head, get trapped in my head. Why can't I be breathing instead, breathing instead? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Someone get me out of my head, get me out of my head, get me out of my head. But it keeps coming back to be that someone can only be me, me. That someone can only Has anywhere from 60,000 to 80,000 thoughts a day I get dizzy just thinking about it How the hell am I supposed to keep up with this? No way, the only thing that I can do to make it through this mess Is slow it down And choose to see the beauty all around And trust my heart can be the driving sound Say yes and do more. 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 Say yes. Sometimes I get trapped in my head. Get trapped in my head. Get trapped in my head. Why can I be breathing instead, breathing instead? Whoa, whoa, oh, someone get me out of my head, get me out of my head, get me out of my head. But he keeps coming back to be that someone can only be me, me. That someone can only be me. Whoa, whoa, oh, it can only be. Oh, Anthony, I love this, you know, and this is so you. Hi, everybody. This is Anthony Federbaum. Hi, Anthony. Oh, you know, it's been a long time. It's been years since I've seen your face. I know it's been a minute. It, it's good. Uh, and I love this song because it's OK. So so give me the lyric of the chorus. Sometimes I get trapped in my head, get trapped in my head, get trapped in my head. Why can't I be breathing instead, breathing instead? Someone get me out of my head, get me out of my head, get me out of my head. But it keeps coming back to be that someone can only be me. Oof. It feels like the story of my life, especially the last couple of years, because I tend to overthink stuff and uh, kind of get trapped in my own patterns. And yeah, this writing this song uh, was very, very healing. And here's here's a little backstory. Yeah, on, give us the backstory on the bridge of the song. Okay. This is this is good because I love I love bragging about my kid, especially <laughs> when he's like he's 10 now. Uh unbelievable. I remember when he was born. Okay, crazy. He's yeah, he's he's getting to be a little big man now. Um, but yeah, when I wrote the song, I, when I was writing the song, I, I was stuck on the bridge 
I was like, crap, what does this bridge want to be? And then Julian just has this way of just dropping these random facts on me. So he like in the middle of my of, of my my writing session, he's like, look, daddy, I have something to tell you. I'm like, what? <laughs> you know that the human brain has like 80,000 thoughts a day. I'm like, really? So I Googled it. And surely enough, it says they say, you know, that the, the human brain has anywhere from 60 to 80,000 thoughts <laughs> a day. And that was the beginning of my bridge that that that's how I got into the bridge. You know, they say the brain has anywhere from 60,000 to 80,000 thoughts a day. So that was I got to credit my kid for inspiring me to find the way in on that bridge. So, but yeah. there's also something in the song. OK, because it, it was going by too fast for me to get the lyric. But there's something in there about it's got to be me. It's something about doing and it's got to be me. Right. What, what's that lyric? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, at the end of the chorus, but he keeps coming back to be that someone can only be me. It has to be me. And, so. and you are that guy, Anthony. I mean, after I, okay, so we met, um, you were doing the Catalina Bar and Grill, which you will, Anthony will be doing this out this Sunday. Tova, I know you're in LA now. This Sunday, Anthony is going to be at the Catalina Bar and Grill. And that's where we met when he was, he, you were opening for Sam Harris the last time. Now you're the headlining guy. And, uh, and uh, what a fantastic show you put on that time. I, I can't even imagine how great this one's going to be. I'm so looking forward to it. Um, but anyway, um, I, there was a point to this. Um, oh, and you were you were, you had you were long off Idol, and you had done you know all this Broadway and all you were you had done all these shows and everything already, and now you've done so much more since. But you became an enormous activist. And as a matter of fact, the late, this is going to get me emotional, but the late great Suzanne Wong and I uh, came and did gang vocals on one of your, one yeah. of your videos. Enough is enough. Yeah. <laughs> enough is enough. And um, you went into this whole other thing about making your music have social impact and political impact. Um, and this song has a piece of that for me. I felt that. Yeah, I mean this this song and every everything that I've been writing, um, you know, of these last I don't know five, six, seven years. Um, I'm really trying to write the kind of music that's going to, you know, that's going to challenge people emotionally. That's going that's going to unveil certain things emotionally, socially, and just kind of bring bring us a little bit closer together to to ourselves and as well as each other and um like this song that i just sang it's so it's called that someone and um this is the song is from a, one of the musicals that i'm currently writing and this this musical i'm i'm writing with with my wife and amazing collaborator jennifer paz um called proud mary's um so well, and what is that title what does that title mean anthony well, it's it's loosely based on on her life. Um, it's basically three uh, Filipino sisters shake up the traditions of a you know Catholic Filipino family by getting knocked up all at the same time. And, <laughs> oh, so she's, she's tackling a lot. Yeah, it's a comedy. Um, so she's she's tackling a lot a lot of her not only family dynamics but also cultural dynamics and sort of just diving into the human experience that she's had throughout her life. And in Proud Mary's is just we we actually we had a, a 20, 29 hour reading of the piece at East West Players. I think that piece needs to be trimmed down a little bit, Anthony. <laughs> 29 <laughs> hours might be a little long to have an audience sit. Oh, uh, but look, we, we had a great audience in East West Players. Um, they... Do you know Gary Kluger? D Gary Kluger? Uh, he, his play is at East West right now. He, he just won an award. It just won. Anyway, oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I mean, East, East West is such a is such a great ground for, you know, just cultivating these types of pieces. And we, we were able to get a NAMT grant uh, for the piece. And uh, NAMT, what is it? And what is that? So NAMT is National Alliance of Musical Theater. So it's it's a grant that basically allows you to develop your piece. That's fantastic. For, it's a pretty big deal in the theatrical world and um so uh, we were able to get the grant and then the you know east west players they've been able to 
give us additional support to make this reading happen. And, you know, we're now in our next stages of development of, of the show. But, you know, again, this is just one example of just the things that I've been, everything that I'm writing that I want to be a part of, I wanted to make some kind of a social or cultural impact because really that's what art is at the heart of it, right? It's, I always say art is sort of the last line of defense before you lose your soul. So if you don't have art to challenge, to inspire, then then that's the last line. Really, that's the last line to our humanity. You know, if we lose that, we, we're... Anthony, where does this come from with you? Because we didn't talk about this last time because I don't think this was part of the deal last time or I wasn't aware of it. So what what's you know, I was around in the 60s and I'm, you know, rat and I was a radical in the 60s because everyone was around, you know, that was where in you, because these are sadly apathetic times, too much so, what awoke, what awakened this in you? Were your parents, um, I know you're, 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 you're from Russia. Um, where did this come from in you? Honestly, and when? I, I think becoming a dad has, mm. has truly shaped my life for the mm -hmm. rest of my life, especially as Julian is getting older. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's coming from a, a standpoint of, of a father and asking myself this question, like, what kind of life do I want Julian to have? What kind of world do I want him to grow up in? And, you know, who am I? I'm just, you know, another grain of sand in this huge box that we all live in. But it's like, how do I, you know, I, I, <laughs> he says, daddy, you lecture me too much. I give him mm -hmm. these big speeches and, and, and lectures and try to teach him how to walk life. And, and it's really comes down to a very simple concept. If I'm telling him to be, or trying to teach him to be a certain way, if I'm not practicing it, then I'm being a hypocrite, you know? I was just going to say, Anthony, you model it in your life. You don't really need to use that many words because you are that person and he's watching you walk through your life and the music that you write, the way you treat people, all of that stuff um, is, is a model for him that is teaching him that behavior every day. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's really where it comes from for me. And, you know, I, I, I want him to be proud of me and I, I want him to, you know, find the best version of himself when, as he continues to walk this life, because the, his generation is facing a whole new other set of challenges than mm -hmm. my generation or your generation. It's, you know, there is, uh, they, they're dealing with a whole other bag of stuff that, um, you know, the best, the best thing that we can do is arm him with the, the tools to love himself, to be respectful, be kind, and, and, and really just live a life of impact. And again, not that I'm going to, you know, I'm winning any Nobel Peace Prizes or anything like that. Like I'm not, I'm just trying to use my art to make an impact as much as I can, even if it starts a conversation. Absolutely. Uh, some memory, um, uh, you know, causes someone to reflect to, to where they can arrive at a better version of themselves, a higher version of themselves, um, then, then my job is done. And then ultimately Julian sees all of this and he already wants to be, he's, he's, he's going down this path of wanting to be a singer songwriter and an actor. And I mean, he's already doing it. He's a working. Wow. So, um, yeah, so I'm just trying to set a good example for him. That's fantastic. Um, and I, I, you were very act, you were very um, outspoken about gun control, and um, isn't that what enough was? It, it, yeah, that's yeah. what that's what that deal was. Enough is enough. Yes, um, and uh, and that fight certainly isn't done. You need to, you need to whip out that video again because um, nothing's been done on that score, which is terrifying. Uh, sadly, we are sad. I'll tell you this. And I truly mean that. Sadly, my songs are still re relevant and they will continue to be relevant. Mm -hmm. um, because we are who, we, like, we are a complicated human cultural experiment that is built on slavery and genocide. Mm -hmm. And for us, to, and, and, but yet we, 
we carry on this sense of promise for a better life. I mean, certainly I would much rather live here than, than anywhere else. Like I, we left Russia for a reason. Um, so it's a tale of two Americas, you know, let's, let's talk about that for a minute, Anthony. So your family, you're from Russia. W what did your father do in Russia? And I, I, I asked you this last time. I, I wanted this romantic story that you guys defected because I, I've seen Moscow on the Hudson too many times. Did you ever watch that Robin Williams? And he's, I defect, I defect. And he defects from the, he was in the orchestra. Anyway, um, what, what was your, what was your father's, what was his occupation in Russia and why did he, how did he, how did you all leave? Why did he choose to leave? Well, we, you know, I was a, I was a young kid when we came, mm -hmm. so I don't really remember much of my life there. But did um, he, has he told you the story? Have you ever, has he told you? We, we, we talk, we, we, we talk about why we left for sure. I mean, they, mm -hmm. They just they didn't want uh, me and my brother, my late brother Dennis, to go into war, because uh, I, I think if we were like they didn't want me to go in the army, and Dennis was going to go in the army because you have to go to the army once. That's an automatic, right? For, so going into the army here and going into the army there are two different things. So they didn't want that life for us. So. Um, yeah, they, you know, they just decided to take the chance and, 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 and we left, you know, we left everything and we were actually separated at the border. Um, when, when we were, cause my mom, my mom's paperwork, there was something she, there was, it's, it's this, this, you know, obviously all this stuff that's going on with Russia and Ukraine right now, but mm -hmm. like it, it's been going on for a very, very long time because mm -hmm. my mom had, a Russian passport. Um, I think she had either a Russian passport, but the stamp was Ukrainian, or she had a Ukrainian passport, and but the and the stamp was Russian. She needed to have either a Russian passport with a Russian stamp or Ukrainian right. Ukrainian stamp. So my dad and my brother were let through, and we had we literally like left everything. We had no money. We had, we had left everything behind, and then wow. me and my mom, because I was under my mom's passport. Uh, we were just, you know, it's like, there's this line, there's me and my, uh, my brother and, and, and my dad, and there's me and my mom. And it was a very traumatic experience because wow. yeah, they, you know, they're like, they could have let us go, but they didn't, they chose not to. And because it was, it was a technicality that could have been fixed. The second we got to New York, we would have just gone to, um, an embassy in New York and it's, it's a simple fix. Mm -hmm. Uh, we ended up staying in Russia for another month and a half or so. Oh my. my mom was, you know, and I stayed at my aunt's house while she went back to, um, to Ukraine to kind of make sure that she, all her, all her stuff was, was done, but it, it definitely like, I mean, I was nine, so it was a very, very traumatic experience and, um, yeah. So. And um, so you guys landed in, did you land in Pennsylvania? Where did you land? New York. New York. In New York. Okay. And so what was that? Did you speak English? No, no. Uh, oh. I didn't speak English at that point. Then we moved right. Uh, we lived in New York for like seven months and then we moved to Florida uh, because my mom was like, okay, if we're going to live here, I need a climate that's closer to my home, which I was, uh, I'm from. Yalta. Wait a minute. Russia's not palm trees. And no, but Crimea is. Wow, so, which is now part of Russia, and, and the, at the time it was it was Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, like Crimea, the best way to describe Crimea, it has its four seasons, but it's like basically um, it's Ukrainian now Russian version of Hawaii in some ways. Like it's just wow. very, during the summer, spring, summer, it's beautiful. The Black Sea, uh, the beaches, this, like it's it's absolute, it's it's magical. Wow, um, so my mom needed to have that familiarity so we mm. moved to Florida and we lived in Palm Coast and Daytona Beach okay now how did you do that only speaking Russian well here's the thing in, in the seven months that we lived in New York I didn't speak a word of English because I was in a Russian class with a Russian teacher the second we moved to Florida I had no one to speak to in Russian I picked it up in three months so it was like so did you watch I would imagine that watching American television would be a help. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I started watching a lot of football. That's how I became a Jets fan. 
Um, I'm, uh, I started watching New York. I Times. hope you didn't watch the giant game on Sunday. My son is still crying. <laughs> um, I, well, look, I'm crying for a different reason. Cause we lost Aaron Rodgers for the year. And mm -hmm. after all the hype and all like, I mean, I, I still have a lot of faith in my team, but that was, I'm still grieving. I'm still going through my, I, I live with a Texan. So there's okay. a lot of, yeah. Got yeah. It. That was a, that was an intense day. <laughs> Um, so, okay. So you're in Russia three months. You're, you're, you're 10 now. Yeah. Ish. And, um, so how, how do you start school when you don't speak any English? You just do it. <laughs> and then. Wow. It was... So, okay. So you're not the, you're not short, but you're not the tall, you're not the biggest guy. Were you getting picked on because you didn't speak English? Was it torture? Yeah, no, there were, there were, there were kids that, that were picking on me um, at times. And I mean, I've, I've never been one to kind of back down from like, if, if someone were to step, like I stood up for myself as a kid. It's funny because I, <laughs> I'm relearning how to stand up for myself as an adult because I did not did not do you know I did a good job of that as a kid you know actually even going back to Russia I, I was when I was like really young I mean I I would say I was a bully at times when I was a young kid and you know yeah so not something I'm proud of but I, I did tell Julian because I'm like look I made my mistakes when I was younger than you um but yeah uh going back to um yeah, I, I, I didn't have any problems standing up for myself when I was a kid. So I'm trying to retap into that and learning how to do it as an adult now. <laughs> but but not with brute force and stuff. No, of course not. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So, so you had another issue going on, which made you different than everybody else. Um, you had some health stuff going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's talk about that for a minute. So when did you know, when did your parents know that something was wrong? Well, this was um, just a few short months into me being born. I had a lump underneath my vocal cords and um, they had to- how did, how did they know that? Well, because I had a hard time. I couldn't breathe. Like I, I stopped breathing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there was a lump there. And the reason I survived is this lump was underneath my vocal cords and mm -hmm. not on my vocal cords. If it was on my cords, then I, I would not be able to speak. So it was it was so close to my vocal cords and they had to perform an emergency tracheotomy and I was breathing out of a tube for the first four years of my life, five years of my life. How exactly did that work? Yeah, I mean- How I, are you a kid going through a kid world with a tube? Yeah, you just, you know, you just go through it and- Were you like the kid in the bubble? Did you just exist in your bedroom? Did you- no, I was, um, you know, I just, I just had a hole in my neck and after a while the, they were able to remove the tube and I could breathe on my own and it just needed to close. And uh, yeah, I mean, my mom didn't sleep for three years for the first three years of my life. <laughs> so, oh my gosh. Yeah, it, it was. Um, were you able to play when you were little? Were you able to? I mean, yeah, but not. Modified, yeah. It was definitely. Um, it was definitely something that, um, that, that, that's a big part of my, my story and kind of something that shaped me and a thing that always reminds me of how fragile things are and to sort of not to take, I've been given a gift and I, I, um, I don't take it for granted. So tell us, uh, when you had the tracheotomy, what was the prognosis? Um, the prognosis, I mean, uh, they basically said that there's a good chance that I wasn't ever going to speak. Um, so this was really, a, I guess, a, a, a waiting game kind of, we'll see what happens, but they were just trying to, um, save Keep you life. alive. Yeah. It, it, there's a, um, a, a specific hospital in Moscow because I, they airlifted me. There was like a, they had to like do an emergency airlift situation in a, you know, helicopter and, uh, transfer, uh, transfer me to this hospital in Moscow. And, um, yeah. And, and, and they basically nursed me back to life. And this nurse, uh, this one nurse who is my mom still talks about her, who is, who played a huge role in, in saving my life. So, yeah. 
Wow. And so how long did it take after the operation for them to know that, how, how long did it take for you to speak? I can't, I'm not sure, to be honest with you. I mean, I... Was it months? Was it a year? Was it... I, I started speaking fairly quickly because the one thing I do, rem like, based on what my parents told me, is I was in this special unit at the hospital and all the other kids had the same thing as I did, but none of them could speak. So I would be the kid relaying what the kids needed to the nurses. Like if somebody was thirsty, if they needed some food, like I would be the messenger that would be going back and forth because I was able to start speaking um, because of the fact that it was underneath my cords and not sitting right on my cords. I see. Wow. And so I assume the last thing anyone thought you'd ever do would be to sing yep. for a living. <laughs> yeah. so, you know, and when you come to my show on Sunday, <laughs> I'm going to be sharing some very, some, some really special um, original material that talks about um, it's, it's kind of some of my life. So, yeah. That, all right, so we'll save that for then. Um, at what point did you? I, I don't. I don't know if this is part of that story, but maybe you can just tell us briefly. At, at what point did you start to sing? So when did the song come out? When? When? And 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 it not only came out, but it came out brilliantly. So did you? Did you? Did you? As soon as you started talking, did you have? I mean, did you have to work up to your voice sounding normal? And then did you have to work up to singing? Like, did it sound funny when you sang it first or no, it just. Uh, well, as far as singing, I uh, my folks have recordings of me singing as early as like three. So I couldn't I could barely speak, but I was already singing. Um, so it's just always it's it's been in me and I, you know, I just yeah i was i was singing from an early age and i would say professionally i started doing it at 14 15. um but it's and how, how how did that happen i started singing in in russian restaurants in philly and new york and that was kind of no wait I, a minute your family's living in florida i thought no 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 so from florida then we moved so so this is we've been all over the place so when we came to the States, mm -hmm. uh, we came to New York, then Florida, Palm Coast, Daytona Beach, then back to New York. From New York, we moved to Philly and my folks still live there. And since okay, I knew there was a Philly in this. Yeah, okay. yeah. And, then from, and then from Philly, I moved to New York. And then after New York, I moved here and I've just been all over the place. So, yeah. Many, yeah, lives aren't linear. So, well, lives are linear, but telling them isn't so okay so at 14 so the like in brighton beach no is it brighton beach is that yeah, where the yeah, yeah brighton beach is where all the russian restaurants are so how are they letting this little kid um do that i mean yeah it's just it's a different culture and you know i my first the first restaurant that i started singing i started singing in philly and then eventually i made i, I made my way to to new york and yeah, I was like 16 at the time, 16, 17. And uh, I sang at this place, uh, Tatiana's, Tatiana restaurant on Brighton Beach. And that was kind of my life up until Idol. So yeah, I sang there from like 16 to 19, something like that. Okay, so now at what point did you make the decision? Okay, this is what I'm going to do. Like, you oh, had I mean, to be a kid. Yeah, I mean, I would like, as soon as I started singing in restaurants and I just, I started making money doing, making music and. Well, but it, the decision happened before you started singing in rap. I mean, one day you're sitting at home and you go, oh, I have a good voice. Somebody says you have a really good voice. I mean, at what age did you discover that you could do that, that uh, you have the goods? I mean, it wasn't, a, so I started before I sang in restaurants, I was wearing out Mark Anthony's music, his, his. Uh -huh. his early albums, um, the the one um, English album that he put out, and then, you know, his salsa albums, like I fell in love with Latin music because of Mark Anthony. Um, so and I was, why, why is that? How did you get exposed to Mark Anthony of all things? I mean, it's, well, Russians love 
Latin music. They just, it, they just, it's just, it's so rhythmical and there's so much passion uh, in, in the music. And, and it's something that I've, I've kind of grew up in, in restaurants. Like you, they sing a lot of cover songs from different artists. And I just, I heard a lot of Latin music in Russian restaurants, ironically. So, um, yeah, I fell in love with Mark's music and I started to imitate his sound cause I wanted to sound like him. And Did you study Anthony? Did you study voice? Not until after idol. So, and I couldn't figure out why everybody told me that I needed to take vocal lessons because they're like, you have talent, but like, you need to go and study. You need to go and study. And after studying, and, and I was very fortunate to, to study with the late Ron Anderson. Uh, we lost him uh, over the pandemic. Um, mm, I'm sorry. He changed my life. And he's changed, like, he is you know, he worked with everybody and he has changed uh, my life in just four, four sessions. And to this day, I don't go on stage professionally without the warm up exercises that we have. I have them transferred on every device, on every sound, you know, uh, every uh, iCloud, whatever you like, because that's been my lifeline. He's been, he changed my life. And now that I understand how to why, why, where I need to play sound and where it sounds healthy or it doesn't sound healthy. I understand why people were telling me like, you need to take lessons because yeah, I, so I, I didn't study leading up to idol being on idol. I would say my, the work on the craft began after the show. Okay. We're going to talk about how you got start how you got pointed in that direction because well why don't you just tell that story now because didn't a certain obnoxious person give you that piece of advice yes um mm -hmm. yeah i mean simon <laughs> was uh after my season and i don't want to i don't want to he's it's not about him being obnoxious because no he's well he just not to you but i mean simon was here's here's, here's, be. here's how i choose to look at it because and this is for anyone who's trying to get into this business um so but leading up to that, so after my season, I went to Simon's dressing room to kind of just thank him for the experience and all that. And the first thing he did is set, he sat me down and he's like, you know, okay, so what do you want to do? What do you want to do with your career? And I was like, I didn't even think you liked me. And you were asking me all these questions. I'm like, so I give the, the typical artists spiel, you know, I want to make a record and tour, blah, 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 blah. And he was like, look, Anthony, you know, <laughs> so he's like you're very likable you have a lot of talent but he's like you're not ready you need to crawl under a rock for the next seven to ten years he literally said that i need to crawl under a rock for the next seven to ten years how old were you anthony i was 20 uh, when i was when i was on the show so you need to crawl under a rock for the next seven to ten years you need to live some life you need to grow and when you come back I, I believe that you're going to be successful and people are going to love you because you have all the all the tools that you need, but you're just you you're not ready. Um, and I could have gone two ways on this. Like when someone tells you you need to crawl under a rock, that can do two things to your mind. You can either feel crushed by it, mm -hmm. or you say you're right because for me, I deep down knew that I wasn't ready. Um, Did you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I wasn't like stuff that I did on Idol. It's just I just took the same songs I sang in restaurants for years and I just brought them in front of 30 million people every week. Like on the show, I was a singer. I wasn't a recording artist. And it I'm 38 years old now. And I'm finally I, I know I because I'm in the best artistic place I've ever been. So I understand now the difference between being a, a singer and a recording artist. They're two different things. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I took his advice and, and I was, and I, I lived life, um, experienced some things that I wish I hadn't, you know, like losing my brother. Um, yes, but also, I'm so sorry. Yeah. You know, as in becoming a dad, you know, getting married and, you know, losing friends to the pandemic, losing more family members during the pandemic and just going through this roller coaster that is life. Now, when I sing and when I write about it, I'm tapping into an invaluable resource that I've lived and that I've experienced. 
And on top of that, I put the time into my craft because I was going to say, and you also took those lessons and got the, exactly. the training. And then, and then, and then, so going back to Simon, mm -hmm. to me, he represented in that moment, he represented two types of, um, two types of voices that you can get in this business. And it doesn't matter whether you're actor, singer, producer, so what, what, and that's, I think it's kind of across the board, no matter what career you choose to go to, which path you go um, down. There's going to be, there are going to be people who are going to say negative things to you just to bring you down mm -hmm. because they have their own demons to deal with. Mm -hmm. and they're projecting their own stuff and, and seeing, knocking somebody else down makes them feel a little bit better in that moment about themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there are going to be people in your life who are going to say the things that maybe are hard to hear, but they genuinely care and they believe that you can handle it. And if you use it uh, to your advantage, you will grow and eventually get to where you want to be. And in the moment when he said what he said to me, that's how I looked at it. I'm like, there's a music executive sitting in front of me who has, you know, um, been a part of hit records and, and has done some incredible things. And he's actually taken the time to let me know I have a lot of potential, but I'm not ready. Like that is that is a gift. And, and if, if I let my ego and, and all this other stuff that is, that that's not useful to an artist, if I would let that other stuff take over, then I wouldn't have gotten to where I am today because I would have been like, who the hell, you know, for, you know, I'm, I didn't do that because deep down, I'm like, you know what? I got a lot of work to do, so I'm going to crawl under a rock and do it. <laughs> so have you ever had the opportunity to have this conversation with Simon? Not yet. And when I see him next, I am going to, I've been dying to, to let him know that because you, I, I can't wait for you to have this conversation that, with Simon. Yeah. That, that moment in his dressing room literally has shaped how I approached these last, you know, 17 years of, of my career, because after Idol, I dove right into musical theater and theater. And, okay. Wait, stop. Had you ever, had you done that in school when you were a kid? No. I, I wasn't even aware of musical theater at all. Like I just wanted to be a pop star. And right. that, you know, so theater was something that I stub stumbled into right after Idol. I got cast in the Fantastics off Broadway. How, well, you, you stumbled. How did you stumble into the Fantastics? One of the greatest shows ever, by the way, Absolutely. for those of you who haven't seen it. And I just, I, I want to, um, you know, I just want to say that my heart is, um, is broken over the fact that Tom Jones recently passed away, mm -hmm. the writer and the creator of the show. And I had the pleasure of, of doing my run with him. And oh. he taught me a lot about life as well, just by observing him and, and watching how he approached his craft eight shows a week. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason I say I stumbled into it is because I don't think I got cast in that show because I was a great actor in that at that point in my life. Like, what made you go and audition for it? It was it just it's something that came across my manager's desk at the time. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm 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 aware that it was probably a stunt casting. You know, you have a kid from from a popular show that you know I had I had a lot of notoriety at that point, and um, yeah, so they they I went in obviously I auditioned I had to like fit the part. Um, they didn't just give it to me. But it turned out that I was kind of like a real life version of my character, mm -hmm. you know, thinking that he knew it all at the time mm -hmm. and often way in over his head and um, being humbled by life at the very, you know, mm -hmm. at, at the end, by the end of it. So I ended up fitting the character to to a T and I that, that was my gateway drug into musical theater. Like I, I got bit by the bug. I fell in love with it. And um, and then for the next, you know, eight to 10 years, I was doing theater shows and I did rent off without, without training. Without, that, you without, had but, never you know, taken an acting class. Are you kidding you know me? But you know what? My training was the incredible actors that I worked with. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I love asking questions. I love being a sponge. So I would just observe. I would observe. I would ask help i would ask for i know it's like a big thing with actors that you know a lot of actors don't like being given notes by other actors i'm the other way like this is not something that i've ever done before so please throw your notes at me like 
and obviously I, you know, stuff that's not helpful, I discard, but things that can help me, you know, I would take in and, um, did you ever go back and take an acting class as, as you did with a vocal class? I, yes. I, I mm -hmm. took, I, I, I took some acting classes here in LA mm -hmm. and that really helped. Um, but I feel, you know, my, you know, the experience that my four-year program, my four-year acting program basically was just being on stage and, and learning from incredible actors that taught me a lot. So, yeah. Wow. Okay. So, and, and I would imagine that when you were doing the Fantastics right off the run of American Idol, that you were getting, that a lot of girls were coming down to see the show and, and that the American Idol fans, I'm assuming were coming down to see the show. Yes. It, there was, stung, yeah. Yeah. There were, there were a lot of fans that were coming to see the show. So it paid off. It was a, <laughs> it was a good marketing decision. Um, but I, like I said, I, I really fit the character. I, and I was even surprised at, because I wasn't sure, like theater, what's like, I just, I don't know. It, it wasn't something I thought about at the time. And, and then the rush that I got, the deeper understanding of storytelling and, and what, you know, an arc of a character, like it became like a drug. It really, it did become like a drug. And, and I just, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. It was amazing. Okay, so let's go back for those who don't know your story. So how how did you get from singing in on Brighton Beach to auditioning for American? I know all you have to do is show up, but so where did you audition for American Idol? You're living in New York. Where did you go? Cleveland. To Cleveland. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and what was that experience like? Did you did you try to sign up for it more than once? Did you hit it the first time? How did that work? Can I just say how excited I am that you're going to come to my show and whoever, yeah. please come to my show. Because again, there's a very, very special number, original number that I'm going to sing from one of the shows that uh, I've writ almost finished writing over the pandemic that talks about that whole experience. Ooh. It's really, really cool. So anyway, um, okay. yeah, I was, I was seeing someone at the time and th that was my first official girlfriend and she was the one that convinced me to go so that was that was that <laughs> and did you have in your head when you were going i'm going to do that i'm going to get on the show nope. i mean no no i was you like i was i was a little skeptical still you know it was fairly new i watched a season you know a couple of seasons before i'm like you know what okay fine one and done if they choose me great if they don't I'm not gonna, you know, yeah. So it was, I had no expectations and um, luckily the stars aligned and, and they chose me. And so um, you had LL Cool J in there on your, uh, and he liked you a lot. Yep. He's like, <laughs> I thought it was slick. That was <laughs> and, uh, and Paula sure liked you a lot. And, and I watched it again today and I was surprised that, um, Simon was actually very, was very nice to you at, at your audition. He's they, you reminded them of Clay Aiken and he, well, yeah, I mean, that's mm -hmm. like, and Simon is, he has a very, he, he, as, as an executive, he has, you know, he looks everything through that lens. Okay. You have this kid, you know, oh, it's, it, cause our nature is to compare. Okay. Is to, is to, um, gravitate towards something that's already familiar, you know, sure. so, so he did he did just that and mm -hmm. it wasn't my intention to remind him of clay and i mean clay is amazing he's an amazing singer artist um but yeah i i was just yeah i just walked in there and not knowing what what to expect were you uh were you surprised that you got through a little bit yeah because you kind of knew you kind of knew you kind of felt it i just I, I didn't see anybody that was quite like me, but at the same time, because I saw so many incredible, incredible um, contestants fall through the cracks. Oh, really? That were just so gifted vocally, artistically. Uh, so are you I, all like warming up out there so you get to hear each other? Like, how do every, you know? Yeah, everybody, because you're you start off with 15,000 people in a stadium. And uh, it's all in the song when I share it. Okay. 
uh, you know, you, you start off with 15,000 people in a stadium and mm -hmm. yeah, everyone's doing their thing, playing, warming up, singing, and it humbles you quickly because you realize that you're not that special. Like, and it's, uh, there are a lot of talented people out there and what sort of, what's, what's, will separate you from everybody else is just how much time you put into your craft and your work ethic. So uh, you know, I, I would say prior to auditioning for Idol, you know, singing in restaurants, I, I thought that I was, you know, I, I had a good voice and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, I did have a, probably a higher opinion of myself than I should have at that point. But when I saw, you know, when I was in the crowd of 10,000 amazing artists, you know, singers, it was like, oh, crap you know so i just yeah i'm like you know what i'm just gonna go do my best and if it's meant to be it's gonna be so i sort of surrendered myself to the process and so then you go into hollywood right now you know you're going to hollywood i know this is in your your song we won't we won't get into too much depth we'll, we'll save that for sunday but you go into hollywood and that has to be thrilling yeah. um but also exhausting i mean what they did to you guys and when you got to Hollywood was like, oh my God, did you, did you do the whole staying up all night and rehearsing with your little group and all of that stuff? Was it brutal? I mean, didn't stay up all night, but yeah, you go on very little sleep and um, this show has a, a way of, of playing with your emotions and, and, but it's good TV, right? So they, they put, they put you through this ringer where, you know, you really get challenged, but I'll tell you this, like, ever since the show and you know i have my moments where i emotionally i break and i get overwhelmed but what this it's like it's you know when you this like you go to the army right you you come back you physically you're fit mentally you have a specific mindset like this was a boot camp mm -hmm. this was this was like a, a musical military boot camp that not only for me it was it it really gave me grit and it was sort of like look if I can do this if I can make it through this no matter whether I win the show or just last as long as I have like anything that gets put in front of me like it's not as scary as this it's not as overwhelming as this because it's just a beast of its own so it just prepped me to ha to have a tougher mindset um, throughout my career so yeah that makes a lot of sense and so now you get through how you, you make it through, you get on the show. What is it like that first time when you're going to be performing live in front of a it's gazillion surreal. million people? It's surreal. You don't, you don't, it just, it's surreal. You literally like what's happening. What is my life? Is it terrifying? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it is, it, it, it was, <clears throat> You stare into that little red dot in that moving camera that's constant, you know, that, and you don't realize that there's, a, during our season, we had an average of, you know, 30 million, sometimes 40 million people watching, like, um, you know, I think to this day, it was, it's like one of the high, highest rated seasons in history of the show. You just don't realize how big the show is. And then I would only realize it when I would go outside. And when I couldn't use the bathroom without being <laughs> was that, it was like, here's another little uh, fun backstory. I was eating sushi uh, not too far from uh, CBS studios. I was sitting at the sushi place and then Tyra, Tyra Banks was, was sitting um, like a few rows over. And then I see these like paparazzis. Um, and you know they're like clipping you know they're taking pictures through the window i'm like oh they must be taking pictures of her i guess they were taking pictures of me because the second i left they left they were following me the whole time to my car <laughs> uh, it was like one of those surreal moments where i'm like what is my life right now um wow yeah it was it was definitely a roller coaster it was definitely a roller coaster and so was it here you are competing with these 12 other 11 other artists are you friends are you 
is, is it, does it become like family? Is it, does it rip your guts out when someone goes home? Or? Absolutely. Yeah. We, it's, it's a, you know, you become a family and when you see one of your family members leave it, it breaks you, you know, it, and it just makes it that much more real that there's going to be less and less people. So yeah, we, we were, we became very close. I mean, obviously just like any family, we had our, you know, dysfunctions and our stuff. Um, but ultimately we shared an experience that's, that binds us for the rest of our lives, you know? So I know you got very close with Carrie Underwood with the winner and, mm -hmm. um, uh, this rumors that you guys were dating. Was, was there any truth to that? No, 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 we were, we were friends on the show, mm -hmm. but yeah, no, the, that's why they're called rumors. It's people assume things and no, but we never dated. And so was it as shocking for you as it was for us at home when Constantine got, Constantine's done my show a few times and I love Constantine. It was so shocking when Constantine got sent I, home. I was ready to go home. I was like, <laughs> All right, I'm good. I made it as far as this. Cause I, you know, I, I thought I was going to get eliminated earlier um so yeah i was very surprised i was very surprised i was like dude really we still laugh about it today because it's just like yeah and he's also gone on to have a brilliant career in the theater he just came off a run with joey pantalon Look, he, he had a uh he had a theater career before idol that's so, right that's right oh so, yeah. yeah so yeah tino he's uh yeah he's 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 a badass He's, He's a badass. So, okay. So now the week that you, you're, you, you came in fourth, right? Huh? So the week that you go home, what's that like for you? So, and, and you had a really good night that night. I mean, yeah, it was, you were great that night. Yeah. But it was too little too late at that point. Hmm. Um, again, I was a singer you know carrie won that and i knew that carrie was going to win i told her every week every time she would be like oh my gosh i'm going to go home i'm like no you're not you're going to win the show like a recording artist won that show that that mm -hmm. year like, carrie was ready to go country girl through and through she mm -hmm. was ready to go if bo was going to win he was already an artist at that point he was ready to go you know uh um, what happened to bo i i I was a Bo fan, what I, but I've not heard of Bo in all these years. Does, does he have a career? He, yeah, he's doing his yeah. thing. We have, yeah. We've lost touch over the years, but he's, mm -hmm. he's doing his thing. So, okay. mm -hmm. um, you know, and then, yeah, like Von Zell, she was already a recording art. Like she knew who she was and the songs that she was choosing. Like there were three actual recording artists before me, at, you know, from the top four that were left. Either of them, you know, if it wasn't Carrie, it, it would have been Von Zell or Bo they were ready to go like just put them in the studio put the machine of idol behind them and go you know how, how do i again there's no no way i was going to win the show but say i did win the show like what kind of a record would i have been what i've made like vocally i wasn't ready i wasn't a rock a pop rock singer at that point you know my love for latin music is I needed to, I needed all these years to sort of discover what that is for me and sort of mm -hmm. understand it and live it. And, and, and also again, study what makes it go, what, what, and, and sort of how, how can I be a part of, of the Latin community? And, and as a guest, cause obviously, you know, I didn't want to be, I didn't want to appropriate anything. I, I just, I, all of these things took years and, and, and life experience for me to learn. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, if I, okay, I win the show, then what I put out a pop record that probably would have flopped and, and that was it. So, you know, so, so the right person won, like they, you know, Carrie, like I, I knew that her career was going to take off because she was, she was ready. She was ready to go. What did it feel like that night when, when you're going home? It has to suck anyway, even if yeah. you're prepared and you're ready, it still has to suck. Yeah, because yeah, there's a part of you like, oh, I'm two weeks away from the finale. That would have been fun. Um, but I, 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 there was a sense of relief, to be honest. Mm -hmm. with you. Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't. I'm okay. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I was relieved in in some ways because it was it was a lot. It was a lot. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so so let's talk about Mark Anthony and this uh, this. It's a, it seems so strange to me that that would be your your idol. Um, 
I, I don't know why. I mean, he sold gazillions of records and he's incredibly famous and successful. But so you've you've had a brush with 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 the greatness of Mark Anthony, haven't you? I have. Yeah, I, I got a chance to meet him for the first time on Ellen, because, you know, when you when you get eliminated, you do the whole circuit, the mm -hmm. uh, media circuit. And, you know, I, I got to meet Ellen DeGeneres and be on her show. <laughs> and Mariah Carey sent me a video message that day. And they played the video <laughs> message live during my segment. She was saying, Anthony, congratulations, blah, 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 blah. I sat there. I was like, Ellen DeGeneres, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mariah Carey, yeah, 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 whatever. Because I just met Mark Anthony. Like, I literally blacked out during that entire <laughs> segment. <laughs> While I had these two incredible, uh, you know, women who uh, I looked up to and admired. I no, no, you had three because J Lo was back there also. Oh, exactly. And so I met, but, but that's as and as much as I love J, you know, Jennifer Lopez, J Lo, like I, because I got to meet her. Uh, I because I was on my way to go live, and then Mark and and J Lo walk out of their dressing room, and I got to give my boy Spencer a shout out because he made sure that. We bumped into each other because <laughs> I knew that um, Mark and, and 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 Jennifer was there. I'm like Spencer, you gotta hook me up. You know what this would mean. To me. <laughs> so he he was like, all right, come on, I'll take you past their 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 dressing room. And surely enough, they come out, and um, yeah, that I I met him, I I hugged him, and I said, you're the reason why I'm doing this. You know, he had no idea who I was uh, at at that point. Oh, he didn't know you were an American Idol. Fine. I don't. I I. I I mean, he was kind and, and, and sweet and very genuine because, you know, when I hugged him, he hugged me and he was like, <laughs> out of luck and, and all that. And I, um, yeah, I just said, look, you're the reason why I'm doing this. And I hope one day I can do this for somebody else. And, and I, I met, I met him, I ran into him again at the, um, the Latin Music Awards later on. And I'm actually good friends with uh, a lot of his musicians from the band still, from his band. And yeah, he just, his music, his voice just really, you know, did something to me. And when you met him the second time, did he remember meeting yeah. you and how important he was to you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I, second time I saw him, he actually remembered my name and he was like, Hey, Anthony, how the f are you? Like, what's mm -hmm. going on? Like we had, had a nice little, uh, embrace and he was, he was being honored. He was re receiving, I think like a lifetime achievement award or something like that. Um, but yeah, he actually recognized me right away because it was maybe like a year after that we missed. But so I was surprised that because I came up to him not thinking that he was going to remember me, but he did, which was cool. That's so fantastic. OK, so let's get current. So the pandemic came. You have a little kid, can't go to school. What do you what's your life like? Did, did you guys get COVID? Yes, we all went through it several times. Several times. Yes. And wow. yeah, Julian's been in virtual since pandemic. So he's been doing virtual learning. Um, when he was in first grade, when the pandemic started, then eventually, because we moved over the pandemic from Beverly Hills to we're in Agoura Hills now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's a really gr the school system here with uh, the Las Virginia school system is is great because you can essentially be virtual all the way through high school if you want and this this option but only that only started in the pandemic no, i assume no no that's been always part of of the really life. yeah so since the pandemic of course it became even more uh, mm -hmm. uh prevalent so um yeah so he's been he's been kicking butt and taking names and getting you know he really so how did how'd he get COVID all this time if he's virtual at home oh well no this was before um I, I no well he got COVID from one of us I think mm. actually from me I think I, mm. I was the one that gave it to him uh when I got it the first time when I was doing Love Actually Live so uh, tell me about that wait we got to go off track because I, I did not see the show I'm sick that I didn't see it because the movie please I watch it every year um was that a fun show to do in which role were you I played um the dad uh Liam, Liam Neeson's character so you oh. had a little so you had the son you had the adorable son in the yeah so so that and and that was actually my first time being on stage as an actor in you know in quite some time and it was a beautiful reminder of how much i i miss being on stage and how mm -hmm. much I want to be back on stage 
so yeah that's why i've been working my way back since just trying to get back on stage and use my voice and tell my story and is, is it a good show i mean i'd love to see it it's such a great concept because you watch elements of the film and then that scene just kind of comes to life on stage oh wow it's 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 perfectly timed everything has to be just right because it's you see elements of the film and then you see a live on stage ah. band and orchestra in the back it's it's beautiful it's a beautiful is there music what's that it's not a, it's not a musical is it it's like this interactive you you watch scenes from the film mm -hmm. that are part of of this this theatrical experience that you get which is you know you sing a lot of a lot of this music that that just kind of and it is an extension of what the film is it's really cool so we get to How play cool. our, we get to play these characters from the movie and yeah i was like ah oh, this is what that feels like i, I miss it i'm gonna get back on stage and start doing this again okay so so you're in the process of writing you're writing your way back so tell us about the projects that you have in the works right now so over the pandemic um currently i'm i'm writing three musicals uh one i've been writing since 2016 and we're almost uh this musical is called hashtag america and we we did two presentations we did one music presentation in new york prior to the pandemic at the green room 42 and then the second one was actually at the catalina jazz club in 2019 before the pandemic hit um and and since then we were able to workshop half the show at act of connecticut mm -hmm. when all the theaters were closed act was able to they were the only equity theater that was working they they were allowed to do like special projects um so we were able to um get support from them and we workshopped half the show and since then uh, we we've been t tweaking the script and we actually have a full show now um the book is written by nick walker um he's a fantastic uh actor he's been uh, from an from an actor actor standpoint you know he's done hamilton ain't too proud to beg and now he's about to do um spam a lot on broadway uh -huh, uh, i know so samantha's vocal teacher is in the spam a lot his name's jimmy smagula he's oh. in spam a lot now yeah so yeah so nick nick is um he's also a brilliant brilliant uh book writer so he wrote the story and then i'm writing the the music and lyric i'm co-writing the lyrics with my friend kyle carter who is also a fantastic actor but he's just such a beautiful storyteller and kyle and i have been collaborating for a long time he was on the lion king tour for a long time now he's he lives in atlanta can you give us the elevator pitch of hashtag america like if you had to give us just a sentence or two of what it's about um here i'll read you the log line there you go um because i just got the log line today because we got to put a, a, a log lines are everything well, let me see. <laughs> See where is it? Hashtag America is an uplifting new musical following a newly disgraced on air personality as she searches for redemption within our ever divided country. A, a pop soul rock road, a, a road trip uh, from sea to shining sea, this bold and brash uh, vivid section of the current American landscape is a meditation of what got us here uh and on the questions we'll we'll want to ask and if we'll ever get to be free so it's a story about two sisters essentially who um who get to explore their their trauma and their family dynamics through a road trip this summer road trip how and interesting that you did not write it for yourself uh, well, this story, um, you know, for me, hashtag America has been an experience of uh, being just pro like I'm learning so much about the experience of different people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, like working with like with Nick Walker and, and Kyle, like just these two amazing black men living in America, being actors, being artists, being activists, listening to their experiences, listening to their life story and i've what i've so it's this is not my story to tell mm -hmm. i am just channeling the 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 emotion but you're not telling their story either 
through this, these. Well, what's great about hashtag America, this is, this is going to be, even though it's going to come from a, a specific point of view, I feel like the story itself is going to be universal. That and, is. you know, and it's combined that with, with the pop music that, that I write and the commerciality of the sound that the show is going to have, mm-hmm. this is, you know, it's going to be, um, it's, it's going to have like a top 40 commercial sound. Every is song. it going to be like a, a rock band that'll be? Yes. Is it gonna, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so with this show, it's it's my my hope for this show. And this is something we talk about uh, a lot is to move the conversation just an inch forward as a society. Mm-hmm. You know, and I've been just trying to be an ally more than anything, um, just creatively, like I said, taking in the stories and flushing out what the musical heartbeat needs to be and and just letting and just learning. You know, this is this. It's been a beautiful experience to listen mm-hmm. and, and to understand, mm-hmm. and um, and just just to be an ally to experiences that are different from my own. Mm-hmm. If, you know, if we can kind of do that a little bit more as a people, I feel like we can. You know, just give space to see each other and listen to each other. That's sort of the goal. Um, so hashtag America is almost done as far as like the first completed draft and then proud mary's which is you know based on jen's award-winning uh tv pilot script that she wrote um we we had our 29 hour read and now <laughs> our we're like um i feel like we're one reading away from it being ready and that's also a musical that's a musical yes mm-hmm. so and is that also a pop musical yes, it's gonna mm-hmm. be yes it's it's gonna mm-hmm. it's gonna be a pop rock musical and then uh, Letters to Dennis, which is it's it's a one act biographical musical that I started writing over the pandemic, and you know because telling other people's stories forced me to look inward and be and try to figure well what is my immigrant experience? I am a Russian Ukrainian American who um, you know who've who's gone through stuff. I don't always feel like I fit in 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 certain areas and, and mm-hmm. you know, I have trauma that I need to unpack that I need to, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. that I need to talk about. Mm-hmm. So I decided, you know, missing my brother and, and wishing I could talk to him. So I started developing this piece and it literally like in the span of three weeks, I wrote three quarters of the show, just demoing and, and everything. Like, cause I, I write and then I demo everything here in the studio. Um, and yeah, it's it's just kind of my my goal for that show is to workshop it next year somewhere. And and this is your story, and you're gonna do it. Yes, this is my story, and I and I'm gonna do it. So I'm really excited about that. It's called Letters to Dennis. So um, I can't wait for all of this. Okay, so before I let you go, Anthony, um, you have you have a song that's gone viral <laughs> that um, that you're gonna do a little bit of. So so tell us a little bit about your viral song. <laughs> So, you know, and I, 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 I love this. I'm going to say this not from a place of like, I can't believe that this is the song. No, I <laughs> love this part. I love that out of the 300 plus songs that I've written so far, and I don't, maybe more, this is the song that is like my <laughs> first actual hit. I love it because it's the first song that I wrote for Julian. Like I was wiping his butt when he was a baby. <laughs> And I almost dropped them because I heard this hook like boop 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 boop. So I like I I finished changing his diaper. I almost dropped them because I I ran to my phone to record this hook before I forget it. And 20 minutes later, I wrote this children's song called "I Poop." And so far, I've never promoted it. And when when I when uh, so uh, Jen and I released this as part of our. That we did our our children's album as a duo um, called Organics Kids at the time. And when was this? This was uh, 2013. Okay. Was 2014. Mm-hmm. And so Alexa came out right around that time. And every, you know, if we were all saying stupid things like, Alexa, can you burp? Alexa, can you fart? <laughs> Whatever. And so I guess people started <laughs> like, Alexa, can you make a pooping sound? Can you poop? So the word poop just kept pushing the algorithm up and up and up. And it just became this viral thing where so like through um, 
gotten over 22 million streams. Oh my God. Counting like it literally like pays the bills. That's the, that's the one thing that pays the bills. So if you have Alexa, help, help a daddy out. I got bills to pay. So just say Alexa play. I poop and just wear it out and wear it proud. And yeah, it's the pretty- only reason mine isn't playing it is because you're coming in through my things. Because yeah, yeah, I yeah. told her and she started. So, okay, so Anthony's going to play a little bit of. Yeah, so I'm going to just do the hook, okay? And then okay. go to Alexa and, and do the rest because, yeah. <laughs> and I, I will sing this song on Sunday too, by the way. So it's, it's in my show also. So so it goes on like this. Because everybody poops. It's true. Everybody poops. <laughs> Not me. Jewish girls don't poop. <laughs> I just had that discussion this morning. Oh, Anthony, I just adore you. And I've so enjoyed spending this time with you. And I can't wait to see your show. Everybody, Catalina Bar and Grill this Sunday night, 730. They can get their tickets online. I put the um, the link in the liner notes. They'll be uh, in the promo. They'll be in the liner notes. Um I just wish you every, every success because not only are you talented and and lovely, but you are, you're fighting the good fight for everybody. And I so respect that and admire it. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And, you know, I'm just, I'm grateful that um, you continue to support me and, and, you know, and, and just, I really appreciate your energy in my life and, uh, I'm glad that we're able to make this this happen, and just yeah, I'm really really excited to share my story on on Sunday. Like I'm I'm very very giddy. Like it's, it's I can see I can see been way too long, and I'm just at this place where I just I can't wait to do it. I I can't wait. So come on out and have some fun with me. Fabulous. See you then, Anthony. Thank you so much. All right. See.